are going to talk about mercantilism today. Does anybody have any idea what mercantilism is about? I know you have not studied it in this course yet, but uh, have you heard of mercantilism any in any other course that you studied hitherto? Hmm. The nasty things he said about mercantilism. Yeah. Okay. All right. We shouldn't be saying saying nasty things about them today, because you know it's difficult to say nasty things about people who sort of said lots of things over 250 years. Yeah, from 1600 to um, 1600 to middle of 18th century is the period when you think mercantilists were saying a lot of interesting things. In fact, about 1550 is more like it. You do not have any group of people at any point of time in Europe who said we are mercantilists, you know like we are sociologists, or we are economists. No, we did not have anybody uh, even articulating a very precise ideology of something called mercantilism. No, we did not have that. But um, quite a lot of people among saying other things during this period also seem to favor certain ideas. It, this idea seem to keep coming up again and again among these people and uh, postscript is that such people should be called mercantilists, which is what happened really. You can think of uh, two points or two periods of time when mercantilists could be referred to as having been dominant in Europe. One is the period up to the end of the 16th century, uh, precisely uh, towards the end of the reign of Queen Elizabeth the first in England, when uh, a lot of mercantilist ideas were spoken that is what is called early mercantilism and subsequently from the middle of the 17th century onwards right up to the middle of the 18th century you find mercantilism of another variety coming up and that is what for want of other words I shall say mature mercantilism. No aspersions intended towards the early mercantilists, but it is just the ideas seem to have gelled in greater detail about this time. The early mercantilists are people who are identified also with the notion of bullionism. What is bullion? Gold. Bullion is gold. It is not even a unit, just gold is bullion. Large quantities of gold is called bullion. Uh, if you wear a little ring in your hand made of gold, you would not call that a bullion ring. Uh, it is just a gold ring. So, bullion is basically referring to a substantial quantity of uh, precious metal gold particularly it is called bullion. People about this time the mercantilists uh, or people who were called mercantilists about this time had an obsession with bullion. They thought that bullion was good for a nation for the simple reason that money was a major form of wealth, money was a major form of wealth and the only form of wealth which could sort of multiply itself through time was money and finally, it is money in the form of capital at least in the view of the traders and merchants money as capital was what really reproduced itself time and time again through different business ventures. Smith was to point out to them that this was ok, but were not they mistaken Smith thought in thinking that money is the only form of wealth and that was well taken too, because the bullionists at least were people who believed that there is nothing worth accumulating, there is nothing worth going for all the time except more and more and bullion 
and of course, money as representing bullion. Now, how was bullion to be accumulated and where is the source of multiplying this? The source of multiplying money is by putting it to trade and working towards a favorable balance of trade. What is the favorable balance of trade? Super, super. What did you have for lunch today? Good, yeah. So, yeah, that did not produce a very cheerful face from you when I said, what did you have for lunch? Probably you are happy because you did not eat what you were supposed to eat today. Anyway, so, yes, trade surplus. Trade surplus simply means you export more, you earn more through exports than you pay through for your imports. So, when you have a favorable balance of trade, what it does is that it ensures that more money comes into the country than the money which leaves the country. Now, this provides the basis for sustained growth. How it does is more money coming into the country, making it more cash rich. A more cash rich country would mean there is a lot more spending going on. When there is a lot of spending going on, there is more business, more manufacturing. When there is more business, more manufacturing, there is more employment. In short, there is prosperity. So, the key to prosperity in the bullionist argument was simply getting hold of more bullion through a favorable balance of trade. So, as you can see, extensive circulation of money within the national boundaries leads to growth. Secondly, making sure that this gold, this precious metal, this money does not leave the country. What is the point of having earned money through a trade surplus only to find it leaking out across the boundaries one way or other? So, prevention of money crossing national boundaries going out, if need be stringent measures prohibiting and penalizing people who transferred money across the boundaries. So, keeping the gold in. Another interesting way to this prosperity is by inducing foreign currency into moving into this country and being spent in this country. You could do it legally by offering higher rates of exchange for foreign currency, so that it comes into this country on a premium and gets spent in this country. What it does is that it preserves your stock of gold, it preserves your own domestic currency and creates a bonus of funds coming in across the border, which creates more spending in this country and sets off the process of prosperity. Not all inflow of foreign currency could be done through legal incentives. Very often, even governments in those days used various artificial, by artificial I mean the governments would think of uh, immediate to be implemented today kind of schemes, whereby you could get Florence, gold Florence from Florence into England, let us say, by getting people from Florence, people from Italy to spend that money here for some specific reason. In short, 
the idea was that foreign currency should be spent in this country one way or other and the governments weren't particular about how this was done. Sometimes for instance, the governments themselves engaged in a policy of what is called clipping. Clipping is to reduce the intrinsic metal worth of domestic currency deliberately, but without announcing it. For instance, if one pound was such and such a fraction of an ounce of gold, then clipping would mean officially keeping this weight in gold, but unofficially tripping off some edge from the pound, so that the pound is actually carrying less precious metal in weight. Now, when it is known that clipped money, domestic money is going around, then automatically what happens is good domestic money goes out of circulation and in its place foreign currency slips in. So, as I said expanding the levels of circulation of money and expenditure of money domestically making sure that there are not significant outflows of precious metals and gold from the country and then third encouraging the coming in of foreign currency to be spent in this country. Then companies which are doing within this country are very often told that it would be better that they paid for their imports not in cash but as a kind of a barter in kind. So, you are importing let us say you are importing let us say raw cotton or flax and instead of uh, paying for it in pound sterling you might like to pay for it say, say through wool, pay through some domestic manufacture whatever, but pay for it in kind. So, that you are ensuring that you earn foreign money and gold for your exports and you do not pay your money for your imports and in that fashion commodity trading tends to help you preserve the stock of cash and the money supplied domestically and perhaps even enhance it a little bit. And then this is a policy which all the countries did not adopt, but Spain was pretty good at adopting this. A country by country kind of a list checking to see whether a minimum balance of trade was maintained with all the countries. At least it was ensured that you do not import more than you what you exported to that particular country. So, that across the board when you add it all up you end up getting a favorable balance of trade. This is a kind of an aggregation process. You make sure that every time you trade with a country, you trade with it in such a manner that you have a favorable balance of trade and then you aggregate it across for all countries you end up getting in general a favorable balance of trade. The other thing was a continuous fear in most governments and particularly the advisors to governments that always somebody was going to do a little bit of mischief about the money. In short, would there be counterfeiting? Would there be clipping done by the governments? In short, there was always a fear that the intrinsic value of domestic currency would always be lower than the value at which it exchanged. During those days a fluctuation in the early days of Bolinism, a fluctuation exchange in an exchange rate was not understood to be something coming out of balance of payments problems. You end up owing more than your domestic currency depreciates in exchange rate. 
the foreign countries ended up buying more from you, you ended up having a domestic currency which appreciated. In other words, exchange rate fluctuations were not understood strictly as consequences of balance of payment problems. Exchange rate fluctuations were thought as having their sources in corruption in the government through clipping and mischievous manipulations by bankers across the countries and finally, forgery. It was believed that currencies with high intrinsic value had a tendency to go underground and would be replaced by currencies which do not have as much intrinsic value in my precious metals as they are advertised to be. So, it was believed that these manipulations, forgeries and so forth were the real reasons underlying fluctuation in exchange rates. <coughs> and some early mercantilists even suggested that these fluctuations can be countered through balance of payment adjustments by simply exporting more or importing less and so on and so forth. In short, what is understood today as a causal chain was put on the reverse by early mercantilists who said exchange rate fluctuations did occur and to set that right, you work on balance of payments adjustments. Whereas, you know today and later mercantilists too understood that exchange rate fluctuations were actually the consequence of balance of payment adjustment problems rather than the other way around. Anyway, one rule which mercantilists were following all the time very strictly is to make sure that different currencies that they came across stayed very close to their intrinsic values. So, the ratio of exchange rates, ratio of currencies in terms of intrinsic values was the genuine exchange rate and the exchange rate which was market induced, induced by demand and supply was something that existed at this point in time. So, there was an attempt in this process to try and ensure stable exchange rates, but stable exchange rates not in terms of manipulating the market towards stability, but ensuring that all currencies tried to stay as close as possible to their intrinsic value. Hmm. By the middle of the 18th century, this attempt to ensure that currency stayed as close as possible to the intrinsic worth became a kind of a standard norm across all countries. And by early 19th century, almost all major European countries were trying to follow a norm of evaluating each other's currency in terms of the gold worth of that currency and it came to be called the gold standard. So, these early attempts by mercantilists to ensure stable intrinsic value ratios of currencies later turned out, turned out to be the precursor to the gold standard which became the international monetary system from the 19th century onwards right up to the end of the first world war which is about 1920. This whole concern about money which stayed close to its intrinsic worth was a concern with what was called good money. That is money which was not chipped, money which was not eroded or money which was not uh, for some reason or other uh, through friction or whatever reasons lost its value or money which was simply forged all of which was bad money. There was a law which came to be 
roughly called Grisham's law attributed to a financial advisor to Queen Elizabeth I towards the end of the 16th century. Thomas Grisham wrote a letter to Queen Elizabeth I telling her that good money always is driven out of circulation by bad money. And so, as a monetary regulation, it is important always to keep an eye on where bad, bad money is, where good money is and what is happening to money. Although it is attributed to Thomas Grisham, it goes back much further to early 16th century to Copernicus of all the persons. 1519, Copernicus is the one who says good money is driven out of circulation by bad money. You know Copernicus had great many other interests including trying to find out whether it is the earth which went around the sun or whether it is the sun which went around the earth. Right, He was the one who propounded the heliocentric solar system. So, but then Copernicus also had little to something to say about money as you can see. Be that as it may, there was a great concern about maintaining good money. There was another argument which Mercantilus accepted quite comfortably, but which was put to tremendous use against mercantilism by the critiques of mercantilism. This was called the specie flow mechanism. Specie, what specie? Hmm? Can somebody tell me what specie is? It is a common English word not in use today, but specie is gold, bullion, precious metal. So, specie flow is basically money flow because most money was in those days were tied up to precious metal. Have you heard of it in its modern avatar? Have you heard of something called quantity theory? What is the quantity theory? Velocity of money. So it shows a relation between velocity of money and P i. What's i? P y. P y. Okay. Y. Okay. Y is output and P is P is price. So the product of price and output will be equal to. It's an identity. It will always be equal to the money value. Money supply and velocity of money. I thought you were going to say money demand. What is P T? Or P Y? It is demand for money, aggregate demand for money. And M V is nothing but the total supply of money in the system. No? So, this identity is basically a money market equilibrium. No? You know it as a quantity equation. In the old days, this was roughly known as a specie flow mechanism how money flowed. Now, the critiques of mercantilism actually talked of this process in trying to tell mercantilists that any increase in money supply will simply hike the prices up and nothing else. So, their argument is useless that is what the critics said, but the mercantilists were aware of uh, the specie flow mechanism argument long before people like whom were actually using it as a critique. What mercantilists use this is as an argument to explain how the volume of transactions in the economy can be increased. If you hold prices constant, you increase the money supply then the number of transactions in the economy has to increase which is the way in which the mercantilists thought progress could be achieved. You pump money into the economy, people transact more and more with that money as a result of which there is more manufacture, more employment and the economy starts growing. So, the specie flow argument 
was used by mercantilists to justify their belief in bullionism. Hmm? The other side of mercantilist argument was trade and balance of payments. As I said already, they were all the time concerned, at least the bullionists were very directly concerned about favorable balance of trade as a key instrument for bringing in more and more money into the country, gold bullion into the country. Early mercantilists, as I said, used to think of exchange rate fluctuations as some things which cause balance of payments difficulties. It was Thomas Mann, one of the most powerful thinkers among the mercantilists, who said that fluctuations in exchange rate could be only tackled not by trying to prevent forgery and other things which early mercantilists were talking about. He said, no, you just make sure that your exports grow and your imports are kept under control. In other words, you work towards a favorable balance of trade. Right? So, favorable balance of trade became virtually an official slogan of all mercantilists by the middle of 17th century. Of course, the mercantilists were not insisting that they should have a favorable balance of trade with every country. They also saw that with certain countries, you had to have an unfavorable balance of trade. In short, from with respect to some countries, your imports might be higher than the exports to them. For example, these countries could be selling crucial raw materials to you, which you need for your manufacturing. So, with these countries, they might buy less from you than what they sell to you. In short, you might have an unfavorable balance of trade with them, but still, you have to have that because you need it. But what you do is on the aggregate you make sure that this gets cancelled out. So, on the whole if you look at all the exports and all your imports you make sure that the sum of your exports is higher than the sum of imports. So, balance of trade being favorable was not in the stringent sense of a deal which you enforce with every country, but more like a guideline which a country follows to ensure that it stays on the road to prosperity, not more than that. The most important way of ensuring favorable balance of trade, of course, is to persistently be protectionist. Yes, make sure that you have a tariff barrier which ensures there that the imports are costlier than domestic manufacture and thereby they are discouraged in the market. At the same time, you ensure that your exports are attractive either by creating export subsidies or giving concessional terms to exporters and such are the matters which ensure that you have a favorable balance of trade. Now, in 1644, in France, the finance minister of France started a series of aggressive protectionist policies, which came to acquire his name. His name was Colbert and therefore, Colbertism became a standard reference to any country which went very aggressively ensuring favorable balance of trade and protectionism. In 1641, 1651, the English passed an act called the Navigation Act, which simply meant that all shipments which English merchants were making from any part of the world should be shipped only in English ships. On the face of it, it seems to be a gesture in nationalism, which of course it was, but more importantly, it was to make sure that the margins of transportation costs also went to your merchants. So, your shipping companies earned the transportation fees, your insurance companies thereby earned 
the insurance on shipping in short not only do you make sure that you have a trading margin by bringing things from rest of the world and selling it to say Europe, you also ensure that you earn margin in all kinds of ways including transportation. So, this was also a way in which you prevented competition because you, if you have a large enough fleet then you end up getting most transportation done by your own fleet. This was particularly a policy which favored British shipping as opposed to Dutch shipping because other than the British the Dutch had the largest fleet for marketing and trading overseas. So, when the British passed the navigation act it simply meant that they were taking a shot at Dutch fleet and making sure that the profits went to the British fleet. Well, pretty soon after that a couple of decades after this the English also passed a law which said that anything which you are importing from anywhere in the world to be sold in Europe, you bring something from West Indies to be sold in Europe, you bring something from India to be sold in Europe etcetera, etcetera. You make sure that land it lands and it is offloaded in an English port first. So, you, you are selling something to France, previously you might have shipped it directly to Marseilles let us say, but now after this enactment of this law you make sure that they are offloaded in London or Manchester or York or wherever some English port and then shipped from there to Marseilles which simply means that demurrage holding the goods the charges for holding goods the charges of uh, uh, you know managing and handling the goods and the charges of offloading and reloading all these went to British merchants. And more importantly as England became more and more and more of an anthropo trader anthropos E N T R E P O D means retrading. England became more and more and more of a retrader bringing in things from rest of the world selling it to another set of countries and so London in fact became the very center of retrading across the world by the end of the 17th century. And this meant both the navigation act and the act which ensured that things are offloaded in England helped considerably in bringing England into the status of a large retrader. And more importantly almost all European countries thought it is wise to encourage monopolies while trading with foreign countries. For instance, the English East India Company was started in 1600 and the Dutch started their East India Company in 1602 and then very soon the French followed suit. So, granting trading monopolies to single companies who did trading overseas was thought of as the best way to protect your interests instead of creating competition. The mercantilists were also very keen that manufacture within the nation grew much faster, so that you had to import less. So, all kinds of technology upgrades, all kinds of new technologies were constantly focused upon as matters worth importing, so that domestic competitiveness grew. Likewise, they also believed that if a nation had skilled, skilled weavers, it is preferable to encourage these weavers to migrate to England rather than import the products woven by these weavers in their country. So, there was considerable amount of thought about encouraging skilled workers to migrate towards the domestic country not only by England, but all the countries which believed in mercantilism. The mercantilists were also acutely conscious that most of the cost of production involved labor cost. So, that 
the best way to lower cost of production was to ensure high productivity for labor. Now, in this lay the kernel of an idea which became one of the most central theoretical ideas from the time of Adam Smith onwards called the labor theory of value. So, this idea about labor which the mercantilists had is the kernel of labor theory of value which came later. While the mercantilists were eager to admit how important skilled labor was for the manufacturing process within the economy and therefore, for the profitability of domestic industry vis a vis foreign competition. And while they were also eager to admit that labor was the crucial element in having such an advantage, the mercantilists also sincerely believed that labor was mostly and ought to be mostly paid only subsistence wage. So, what would happen if labor got something more than subsistence? What is subsistence wage? Who can tell me? Sovereign. What is subsistence wage? Mm. Average wage might be subsistence wage, might not too. Basically enough for them to sustain themselves. Pardon me? It is enough for them to sustain themselves. Right. Subsistence simply means Sustance. bare living. So, labor wage which ensured bare living is subsistence wage. Almost all mercantilists believed that labor actually got around subsistence wage and it is also good to make sure that they get only that. Because they had a low opinion of labor as a class. They believed that laborers were profligate, drunkards, spendthrifts, they did not know how to use money. In short, they were like not very, very far from the oxen which worked on the farms, the bullocks which plow, pull the plow had four legs and the laborers were thought to have two legs. The mercantilists had a pretty low opinion of laborers. So, they were good to have, they were good to have, but it is also good to see that if they got more than subsistence wage, they drank themselves silly, they threw the money around, wasted it and more important and most important if they got more than subsistence wage, they did not turn up for work, because they would have enough to eat. So, the next three days they would not come, because they earn money today. And then when this money gets finished, then they come back to work and say all right, what is there for me to do. Mercantilists believe therefore, that you give them a lot of money, you are encouraging absenteeism. So, they believed that by and large as far as labor supply goes, the long run labor supply function will be close to subsistence wage. In the short run for some reason or other especially due to demand for labor, you might find wages going up above the subsistence level. Immediately the quantum of labor offered in the market is withdrawn, labor supply shrinks. So, the higher the wage is above subsistence wage, the more the labor supply shrinks. So, here you have the early version of a labor supply theory, which became very popular <coughs> from late 18th century onwards and right into the 19th century. This is the idea of a backward bending labor supply curve. That is beyond the point if you increase wages labor supply diminishes. So, labor supply increases with labor supply has a positive correlation with wages only up to a point, then the whole thing switches around it becomes an inverse correlation. So, this idea of a backward bending supply curve 
had such genesis in this mercantilist idea about subsistence wage and labor supply. Hmm? So, what causes manufacture to grow more workers? Because you followed a theory which said most of it was done by labor, right. People earned money so that they could start manufacturing and who did the manufacturing? The workers. So, you employed more workers if you wanted more manufacture, that was very clearly understood. So, the limit to how much you can manufacture is governed by the labor supply and how many laborers you could employ is given by how much capital you have with which you could employ them. So, the mercantilists have had a very interesting theory of demography. They said that the population of the working class, population in general but population of the working class in particular should be encouraged to grow because the higher the number of workers available the higher the possibility of manufacture. But what is the limit they said it should grow at least at the same rate as that of capital accumulation. So, that as you earn more and more and more money you could uh, work I mean you could more and more put more and more workers to work. So, labor supply should increase at least at the rate at which capital was accumulated. It is very interesting theory quite in contrast with demographic theories which came up in the 18th century especially after the physiocrats. We will talk about it when we are talking about them couple of weeks from now, but at this point in time it is important to see that the mercantilists were one of the few people who talked about the need to have a growing population, growing working class as the key to prosperity. It's not, so, it is not just trade balance, it is not just positive trade balance but that positive trade balance could be realized only if domestic manufacture grew and domestic manufacture could not grow unless you had sufficient hands to manufacture. And therefore, they said the number of hands available to manufacture domestic goods should constantly be on the growth. How much growth? As fast as you accumulated capital the population should be available for you to work. So, this was a theory of democracy. demography which is nothing like what came later 100 years later right. It is almost as if the mercantilists are saying if I want to make too many lot of shirts then I must grow a lot of cotton. Unless the cotton fields grew in size you do not get enough cotton to make shirts. In the same way unless the population grew you do not get enough workers to make the shirts. So, the mercantilist demographic theory is a very interesting very important theory which we must keep in mind. Now, what do you find is happening amongst the mercantilists here? You find in sheer contrast with what was happening at the time of St. Thomas Aquinas and so forth um, at the time of the scholastics. You found that the whole attitude towards trade whole attitude towards profiteering, the whole attitude towards business was if nothing moralistic, restrictive and suspicious. And we also saw that about the time when St. Thomas was writing actually business was prospering across Europe. Merchants were growing in size and the volume of trade and this was becoming a source of suspicion for the church. A because 
is a new source of political power coming up in the system. But more important, people with a lot of money will learn the art of doing whatever they want and getting away with it because they can pay for it. And if that is the case, the world would might well become a world full of sinners. People might become immoral. This was a basic fear which the church had, which gets reflected in the way in which St. Thomas Aquinas was writing. At the time when St. Thomas Aquinas was writing, evidently it did not matter if he suspected the merchants or not, because the merchants were not in command at that time. But by the middle of the 16th century, towards the end of the 16th century, as I told you, two or three things had happened which changed things around. One, the discovery of the Americas and the influx of gold and precious metals from the Americas into Europe, particularly via Spain and Portugal. This suddenly meant that the volume of money available for transactions was growing and the volume of precious metals out of which the money supply came was also growing, which means that there was a slow inflation across Europe. For instance, between 1500 and 1650, it was believed that the prices tripled across Europe, which means there was a slow creeping inflation, which is good for business. If the prices are increasing dramatically, then it is not good for business because conditions are too insecure for business. Whereas, if there is a slow creep, creeping inflation across the board, then it is good for business because the businessman can know how to manipulate and push business, business around so that they could maximize their business profits. So, by the time the mercantilist ideas were in to the fore, merchants were to the fore in Europe as an interest group, a major interest group. And this was also the time when nation states had come into existence strongly, positively and aggressively. So, which is why it is a collusion of interests. The interests of the states coincides with the well being of the merchant class. Everybody stands to gain with a favorable balance of trade when money comes into the country. The state benefits because it has money to buy arms with make more arms with and to fight more wars. And the merchant tells them how to get that way, tells them this is the policy which you adopt to get there, favorable balance of trade, protectionism and so on and so forth. So, for the first time, the policy of the government becomes very important in European history, monetary policy, trade policy, policy towards manufacture, business, you name it. In other words, the government as a major macroeconomic actor comes to the fore in European mind. And this preeminence of the government as a major economic factor comes about with the government in collusion with the trading class, the merchant class. <coughs> So, perhaps a person like Karl Marx writing in the 19th century, when he said the state is always articulating the will of the dominant class of people, the first evidence which Marx could probably find was with mercantilists. He argued while under feudalism the rural aristocracy was powerful and therefore, the interest of the state coincided with the interest of the aristocracy. But however, the decline of aristocracy, the right of rise of the towns and the trading classes, the merchants, businessmen made sure that the balance of power act of the state enabled the state to support the merchants against the feudal aristocracy. 
because the states, the kings, the monarchs did not want to get under the control of anybody least of all the feudal aristocracy. So, you found that the states were encouraging the merchants, businessmen as a new source of economic power on which they could depend. For example, the mercantilists repeatedly argued that an economy where money is circulating far and wide is an economy also which has a rich tax base. So, you encourage money circulation in the economy, you encourage vast volume of trading and transactions, you are also encouraging the tax base of the economy to grow and a good tax base is always good for the government it builds the power of the government. So, this collusion between the class of merchant capitalists and the state became absolutely pronounced at the time of the mercantilists. It is therefore, at this point in time that was born the idea in European mind the idea of political economy. Economics was not just policy, economics not so much agriculture, not just manufacture, not just trading but it was a collusion of the state with a specific class group in the economy. So, that particular types of policies become highlighted, particular types of economic policies became significant. So, economics is not just economics, it is political too. So, the word political economy comes into vogue with this collusion of the merchant class with the state. Do you have any questions up to now? We have covered a big ground actually in today's class, first class. Do you have any questions which you might like to ask and clarify? Well, you do not have any questions at this point. So, what we will do is we will close this particular session and go on into the next session to start with a critique of mercantilism I mean, and then to go into a very interesting exercise as to how mercantilists were thought to be bad guys for 200 years from 1750s right on to 1930s when suddenly somebody comes up in 1930s who conducts a major revolution in economics. He says, hey, actually the smart guys were the mercantilists. They said a lot of things which all of you missed out on. So, let us look at mercantilists again. The person who said this was John Maynard Keynes. So, let us look at what happened and why Keynes thought mercantilists were actually sensible people. But for the present, we will call off the class now.